All right, let's start with uh, what biblical studies is about. Uh, even though I've seen what you've written, I want you to say, uh, and uh, I guess we'll start with George. You're the first one on my screen. Uh, do you feel like there was the right balance of strictly textual courses in your curriculum? And uh, I would guess that the what you got out of them varied from class to class. Maybe what you already knew varied from class to class. What was your experience and did you get enough or too much of text? Yeah, this, this particular semester, I would say I didn't get it as much as I have uh, in previous semesters. Um, uh, we, um, one particular course, the critical issues of the Bible, we really went from text to text, looking at different criticisms. And so we did more biblical study in that class. Um, but in biblical studies, or, or, or rather, yeah, biblical studies and preacher in his work, it was more so, I think, looking at contemporary views, looking at um, skills, as a preacher and things we need to do and how we can be, become better preachers uh, and students of the Bible. Um, what I love about this particular course, um, it really challenges me to look outside of my traditional views, you know? Uh, and, and so I, I had a mixture this semester. Okay. And your overall experience here, George, uh, do you think your curriculum had a good balance of textual courses and others, or uh, would you rather have had more of other fields or more of textual? Uh, I would say more textual, because that's you think yeah, so? that, that's what I need right now in my life, I, I would say. Okay. All right, let's jump over to Tucker with the same thing. In general, uh, uh, you said you got a lot out of, you learned a lot yeah. in your textual classes. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, if I'm understanding correctly, I think my degree program has five textual classes that I have to take, but it's not limited to five. You know, you can take you can take textual courses for electives, which is what I think I did. I think I took like one or two. Um, so it was well over one a year that I took a textual course um, uh, because I mean, I've only been here three years uh, at Faulkner. Uh, and so I think I got a good amount of textual classes in and I think it was a good balance having at least one a semester or one a year textual courses um, that really balanced out the schedule a lot um, and like I said in the in the um, paper or in our uh, when he asked us to kind of describe what we we're going to say today I, I think it, those classes are really important because we're like actually diving into the text um, and that's what the whole class is about is discovering what's in the text the um, underlying issues and things that really we don't look at uh, on a day-to-day -day basis when we're reading our Bibles. Um, so I really enjoyed those courses and I really thought it uh, is, was very important to have one at least once a year or um, every semester. Let me ask you this, Tucker. Um, did you get, um, and again, it's probably varied from class to class, did you get a good balance of learning how to study the Bible and information that you hadn't thought about before. Which did you get more of? I definitely got more of the information I haven't thought about before. Um, it wasn't so much like you need to, you know, this is how you need to read it or this is, um, you know, how you study your Bible. It was more of like, okay, these are the different things, you know, within it, which I guess does help with how you read it. Um, but it wasn't, I guess, so much about that as much as it was presenting the material that may not be, um, you know, common to most folk. Um, so that was really what the classes were about. But you did learn a lot. Oh, I learned, yeah. Those textual courses were, were great courses. Um, learned a lot in those. And, of course, you're taking biblical interpretation this semester, so now you know how to interpret. Right. <laughs> Garen, you're up. <laughs> What is uh, your is your degree text? Yes, sir. Biblical text. So you had a lot of textual courses. Yes, sir. Um, my, 
Um, no, not enough. I was actually looking at looking at them and uh, looking at some of the things that were offered, and uh, there were a few more that I would have liked to have been able to 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 take under under certain professors for sure. Well, how much? Um, I, I'm not asking for an actual count. Did you take one or two every semester? There was actual Bible text. Um, at least. Okay, I'm trying to think. Of, I don't remember one. The I don't remember taking one my first semester, but I know I took one every semester after that. And I might have even took one the first semester. Weren't you in Life of Christ? I was in Life of Christ. I guess that one counts. Yeah. As technical. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Something came up on my screen. That's okay. All right. Um, how much uh, balance have you had between Old and New Testament? Um, mine was probably pretty balanced um i've taken um ezekiel and daniel um the pentateuch which is a requirement for everyone and um uh, <coughs> isaiah um hard to come up with them off the top of my head but then the new testament i've taken the life of christ uh i've taken uh first and second timothy and titus i've taken the book of acts um and then I, don't, I guess the steps of the apostles, the class we're taking over here, would count as New Testament as well. So, yeah, it's pretty balanced. Well, uh, tell me this. Um, sort of what I was asking, Tucker. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you had assignments that taught you interpretation skills in textual courses? Or, I think Tucker leaned towards, it was mostly facts, including the background and the situation, but it was mostly information. Uh, is that how you see the textual courses? Um, I would say it depends on the route taken uh, in in the courses, um, varying between professor techniques and, and things along those lines. And I don't think either of them are, are bad. I can just think of some of the online textual courses that I've taken uh, under, um, excuse me, <coughs> still getting over a little travel, travel bugs. but. Uh, Mm. Some of the classes I've taken under uh, Dr. Gleaves, um, several of the assignments were um, directed towards us trying to understand it ourselves, I guess. As in, uh, under the, in the class, the Book of Acts, we had to summarize each chapter, four chapters a week. Um, and so that was us kind of getting into it and understanding uh, are trying to understand what exactly was going on, uh, et cetera. And, and so that, I mean, that's one example. And then I mean, other classes with certain other people, I mean, it was more fact based, but I, I like that type of, of class as well. It doesn't bother me either way. Um, so yeah, I think textual classes were extremely beneficial. And that's the reason I wanted to take biblical text was because I, I felt like that was the most important thing. And I think I mentioned that in, yeah. in what, I typed out was that was the, the biggest thing because it is in mean, the inspired word of God. And, and so that's the thing that we should be taking the most serious anyway. Just off the top of your head, knowing that it might, you might change your opinion later. Uh, can you think of a textual course where you really learned a lot you didn't know or hadn't thought about? Is there anything um, stand out? The one that comes to mind would, well, the, the class that we're taking right now here, just because it's fresh on my mind, would be um, in the Steps of the Apostles, just because it was so, I mean, we could go and see the places that we were looking, uh, talking about, so that, and that's pretty cool. Um, but the other, I guess another class that would, would stick out would be Second Timothy and Titus, on believes, um, just because it was, there, it was three small books, you know, and, and, and so we were able, I mean, in an eight-week course, I mean, we, we flew through them pretty good, but we were able to read through them multiple times and, and really be able to dig into the material. And those books aren't things that are, I mean, they're, obviously they're important, but they're not heavily discussed, or at least they weren't um, in, in, in my upbringing, I, I guess. And so I, I, like I learned a lot because a lot of the material is extremely important. So there's something in there besides the qualifications of elders and deacons? There is, there is. That's all I ever heard growing up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, plus, uh, study to show yourself proved to God to work with the knees, not to be ashamed by the dividing word of truth. Yes, sir. That's what we got out of this. All right, Jonah, you're up. Hey, yo. Family, right? 
What? <laughs> Your major is youth and family? Yes. It doesn't have as much textual requirement as the others. No, it does not. Count the core. About how many text courses did you take? Mm, honestly, I've lost track. I, uh, I what were some that you took from the Old Testament besides Pentateuch? From the Old Testament? Mm, yeah. I took a class with Jimmy G. I can't remember what it's called, but uh, I know that I did most of my studies from Isaiah in that course. I know All I did right. a big on Isaiah for it. That's okay. the only one that's mine, though. Then in the New Testament, not counting life Christ and Pentateuch. Uh, do you remember any of those? I'm sorry, say again. In the New Testament, uh -huh. not counting life of Christ or Pentateuch. Uh, did you take any other text courses in the New Testament? Uh, I took Book of Acts. Yeah, Acts. Uh, but you didn't take like any of the epistles or anything like that? Uh, I don't believe I did. Okay. Do you, are you comfortable with the balance in the youth and family program that you've concentrated more on ministry than on text? Is that, do you find it a relatively good balance? Uh, not really. I think that there needs to be more courses at Faulkner that have to do with youth and family ministry specifically. Um, I find that the balance is way off. I think there's way more text courses. There's only one course that's offered right now at Faulkner that has to do with youth and family ministry. And I think it's called that still. I know when I took it, it was called youth and family ministry in the local church. But And we went over great stuff. I've talked to you about it before in this course. Um, but it was while all the discussion was good, it was way too much jam packed into one course. There needs, I think that there needs to be, it needs to be spread out some um, yeah. and courses need to be opened up for that. All right. As um, far as the courses go, I wanted to add a little bit off of what Tucker said a minute ago, how, uh, you know, one of the things that he liked was we were, the textual courses he was able to like just dive in uh, and and figure out what the text was saying in the context and everything one of the things that i also gained from the textual courses was being able to do that um on my own and to be better equipped to um do bible studies by myself and to research and figure out what different texts were saying and that kind of thing Okay. Well, I appreciate it. It wasn't the main part of yours, but uh, you appreciated what you got. Did you learn anything in textual courses? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I felt like since I've come into Faulkner um, and versus where I am now, I feel that I'm much better equipped with knowledge from the Word of God than I was coming in. Well, that's wonderful. Now, the next category uh, used to be a requirement in the old degree plans. You had to take a certain number of doctrine classes like the New Testament church or uh, millennialism or something like that. It's no longer an, uh, a separate requirement. Did any of you take a course that was about a particular doctrine or a particular part of scripture that wasn't a textual course or a historical course? Mm. I, I don't think I, don't I did. Think so. I, when you said that, when that question was on the thing you sent us about, you know, talking about this today, I was thought you meant like talking about doctrine within the classes. Right. Um, well, and I'm going to move to that in just a second, Tucker, because that's, that's what we have. But y'all don't remember taking a course like I'm going to study the doctrine of the church or I'm going to study um, the cults, something like that? No. No. Okay. Do you, do you think we need to add more emphasis to that or are you fine with it the way it is? Uh, I'll, I'm going to say no on that one. Don't add anything I wouldn't. Uh, in that area. <laughs> uh, I struggle with it because doctrine just means teaching. And so what is a doctrinal course? Which courses do we have that don't teach? <laughs> okay. I think now back to what Tucker said. Did you find some broader concepts of doctrine in classes instead of just verse by verse study such as the nature of the church the plan of salvation uh the trinity uh maybe premillennialism did you cover any broad subjects that weren't a verse by verse study mm. more than just in passing just i guess one that came to mind when you were listening those uh 
examples off was um, in our Book of Acts class that I did. When I took it, John Podom was teaching it that year, um, and we talked about the steps of salvation uh, pretty frequently in that class. Um, we had a lot of people who were Bible majors in it, and I'm pretty sure the class was filled up that semester. Um, and so we talked about that quite a bit, so, even yeah. though it wasn't specific to the course necessarily. Okay. Uh, Tucker, you had said you were looking at it, well, was there doctrine in any other courses? Was there? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you take any Don Myers class, you basically deal with a lot of doctrine because he handles a lot about um, the Book of Romans. And I think that's a lot of where we get our doctrine from in the Church of Christ. Uh, Romans seems to be like the, the, the book we go to almost. Um, used to be Acts. Yeah, used to be Acts, yeah. But, uh, I mean, you know, and we do talk about Acts with Dr. Myers too, but I seem to really get a lot of my doctrinal um, stuff from, from Dr. Myers and Dr. Brenham and um, cause I don't know if this really falls into the category, but I did take world religions with, mm -hmm. um, with Todd Brenneman and that class dealt with, you know, to a certain degree, it did kind of deal with the teachings of different religion religions. Um, so I guess that was kind of, uh, doctrinal, but it wasn't so much about the, you know, like Christian doctrines, more about, you know, other religious groups, their doctrine. And, 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 Hey, and, and, you, and just to add to that, what, what Tucker was saying, uh, yeah, I he kind of jarred my memory a little bit about a class I took. I think it was Dr. Todd or um, yeah, I think it was Dr. Todd. It was dealing with, I believe, history. Uh, I think church history. Church history, from, yeah. Right. And, and and we probably were in the same class, Tucker, I think from 1600 up into the Restoration Movement. And I tell you what, I learned so much that uh, I, I didn't realize, um, you know, how influential the Catholic Church um, is yeah. on Christianity. I mean, I'll, and, and then, of course, to, to kind of navigate down through through history after the Catholic Church and how the Protestant movement and how all these individuals led up to the Restoration Movement was really an eye opener because I realized, my goodness, we've grown up. Uh, in a culture that, you know, we blasted and been very dogmatic toward, you know, Catholics, toward Protestants, anyone else, any other denominational uh, church. But then we, if we're going to accept reality, is that we've been influenced greatly by them. And that really opened my eyes and said, you know what, my gosh, uh, I, I have to really step back and, and, and stop being so narrow minded that, you know, this this religious this religion thing is is more um, complicated than I thought. Right. Yeah, and, and some of it we did inherit from Protestant re uh, Reformation. Some the ecumenical councils of the Catholic Church, things that we accept. Part of the reason is because they've been accepted so long by so many people, and yet we say we're just a people of the book. It's better to be aware, I think. Yeah, and I appreciate that you got that from your history classes. Were you going to say something, Tucker? Yeah, I think George brings a good point because the church history courses and the restoration movement, which I guess falls into church history, kind of is we did talk about doctrine in those because, you know, we, we talked about the doctrines that kind of um, in church history, the doctrine that caused splits, you know, from one group taking what, you know, OK, we don't believe that Jesus Christ is a son of God anymore or, or whatever it may be. Um, so we did a deal with, a little bit with doctrine. And so I think that, like, I don't think we need to add doctrine classes, like more doctrine classes at Faulkner, because, like, we get a good dose of it all in um, the different courses throughout. Okay, Karen, that brings up a question I had for you. Yes, sir. Uh, the deep thinker, headed mm. for a PhD. No. Um, in Churches of Christ, we say we don't have a creed. Mm. We just go by the Bible. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, if we start lining up doctrines that you have to ascribe to to be accepted as a leader in the Church of Christ, do we have a creed? And do we want to say we don't have one thing we all teach on salvation? Do we want to say 
we don't all have to agree on the Trinity or the Holy Spirit. Uh, those broader subjects, do we need to study them? Um, I think they're worth the study by any means. I mean, to say that there's just because there's not a specific answer that everyone is going to agree on doesn't mean you can't study it and doesn't mean you shouldn't have your own opinions on it so that you can discuss those type of things because those things will get brought up in um, academia or, or in philosophy discussions, things along those lines. Mm, good word. Um, thank you. The, I, I think that they are important enough to, to be studied for sure, but I also think it's something a lot of us need to, I guess, not necessarily understand, but um, get, get to the point of, of making the, the absolute best decision that we can and, and being okay with that, um, having what we have and, and, and using that. Yes, sir. It seems to me that a good example would be uh, the Trinity. Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, in some ways, maybe the big one, if you go back to the Catholic ecumenical councils, you had to believe in the Trinity. Yes, and sir. virtually all Protestant and, of course, Catholic uh, related churches Trinity is absolutely out there. And yet we have in our tradition, uh, especially um, Stone, but to some extent the Campbells, didn't want to be pinned down on the Trinity. Right. Uh, do you think you understand the Trinity? Do you have a firm opinion on whether you agree with various councils on that? My stance on it, as well as other issues, um, would be I understand what I need to understand. And if you want to argue something that in the grand scheme um, is either, I guess, non-beneficial is not the word I'm trying to come up with, but um, it, it, if as long as we know the, the baseline and we know what, what matters to us, we can debate about the opinionated or the, well, I think this, but it doesn't really affect the, the actual bottom line. Um, I, I try personally to stay on the, well, let's, let's talk about what matters first, make sure we have our, our bearings there, and then we can hypothesize or, or, or wonder about the, these other things. So I, I do feel like I have a, a pretty good basis um, on, on those subjects, and I don't have scripture in front of me, but I mean, if we were having a conversation along those lines and you had some questions, I, I feel like we could come up with some pretty good solutions, but um, either, like you said, I mean, at the end of it, you might have a differing opinion, but as long as our, our bottom lines are are similar to, to a certain extent, I mean, I think we'll be all right. Okay, let me follow up on what you said. Yes, sir. If you had to choose for a sermon or a class or something, you could only do one doctrinal subject. Let's say your elders have called you in and said, we want you either to preach on the plan of salvation or the Trinity. Which one would you first go after? Um, I would. I mean, I would probably shoot for the plan of salvation. Um, and why? Because I feel like there's a lot more scripture behind it. Um, not to say that there's not a lot about the Trinity, but I, I feel like you'd be able to present that in a, in a better way that might be more beneficial to whoever you were trying to speak to. Okay. Do you realize that uh, outside of our fellowship? Most of them would say the Trinity was more important. Uh, uh, I, I never thought about it, but yeah, I could definitely see that being the case. Okay. Anyway, uh, I'm not really looking for particular answers here. Yeah. This is for us all to get a perspective on what do we mean by doctrine? Uh, mm -hmm. How do we approach it? And I appreciate that. The next one on the list is church history. As I remember, most of you only took restoration history. It's the only church history course you took, and you're taking it this semester. Is that right? No, no, sir. Not this semester. Uh, we took restoration two semesters ago. We took restoration movement, yeah, two semesters ago, and I took survey of church <coughs> history. So you took survey. George took survey. Yes. What did you take? Yes. Jonah hasn't taken Jonah, the church uh, history. Yeah. So me and Jonah haven't taken church history yet. And Garrett, aren't you signing up for it this summer? Yes, I'm taking it this summer with Dr. Brenneman. Okay. Now, you really can't do church history in a textual course. You can bring in important uh, 
information, but church history, as we are discussing, it is after the Bible. So it's not really a textual matter. Now, George, you started on this, and you said you learned a lot of doctrine in church history. Did you learn anything about names of movements or names of leaders or anything that's valuable to you, or was that important? Well, <clears throat> based on my what I remember, um, and that's not very, very much without seeing some documents in my face. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I believe we talked about the church fathers, which mm -hmm. um, I think who was who church fathers. You're looking at uh, Aaron Aaron has, uh, 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 yes, and 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 that um, I think we talked more about them and um, their their writings, which which um, supported um, you know scripture, uh, which confirmed. I, I think that the the question in that class was. Uh, how do we validate scripture uh, or if, if someone says is, is scripture, you know, if it's really real, uh, how can you really know uh, if if there's no, um, I, you know, if there are no eyewitnesses or if, if it's very little eyewitnesses during a certain time. And so the, the thought was what church fathers lived um, after and during those times. And so their uh -huh. writings confirmed that you know, individuals like Jesus and, and some of the apostles. And so mm -hmm. I thought that was what was really good. Okay, now, Tucker, you also took uh, the survey course, right? Uh, yes, I also took the survey and church history course. How much of it was about facts and dates and people and movements? Oh, I was basically the entire course okay. was about, like, providing information about, you know, the church from the beginning you know, all the way through uh, to the restoration movement, so. And what is your conclusion on what seemed to be the point of why you need to know that? I mean, I, like I said in that little paper again, I think most people in the Church of Christ or any Christian or any part of religion probably can't trace the origin of how their uh, particular religious group came about. Um, people don't understand the things that played into the Church of Christ coming about, you know, the Restoration Movement. But before that, you know, people like Martin Luther, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, um, different people like that we talked about in the course. And of course, we talked about the Church Fathers like, you know, Arius, and we talked about Tertullian, Josephus, and um, Erasmus, and other people like that, Eusebius, I mean. Um, so, like, it, it was really important to talk about those things, about how, you know, how the church had its beginnings, because without those people, we wouldn't be where we are today. Without the factors that played into it, we wouldn't be where we were, where we are today. And I, I think it's very important to, to know those things, because, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of doctrinal issues, like I said, happened in those times. Splits happened. Um, and, and different things uh, about that, about like, you know, other movements coming about. Um, and I wrote again in that uh, paper that you had us uh, write before was, um, I probably needed the most growth in that area before I came to Faulkner. Um, and I definitely learned so much. That was, those are probably some of my favorite courses or the church history courses. Cause like I had very little to no knowledge about um, the things we talked about. Um, so I really enjoyed those. You know, I think that many of us who grew up in the Church of Christ were brought up to believe that we're the true church. It's always been here. We can skip that church history stuff. And uh, and if you read a little bit, you find out, mm, maybe I should pay attention to that. Yeah. Not only exactly. to understand who we are, but to understand why other people ended up where they ended up. Exactly. Yeah, and it kind of helps you understand uh, where we are today, uh, you know, how diverse everything is um, with religion. Okay. John, are you still there? I want to ask you something. Yeah. You took the Restoration History course? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Okay. I think I know the answer, but this is just to start the discussion. Was that mainly proven that the Church of Christ is right and everybody else is wrong? Is that the point of the course? Mm, no. Okay, so now follow up on that. Well, 
what do you think was the main thing you got out of that course? Whether it was uh, your favorite one or not. Whether what? Whether it was your favorite course or not. Uh, I just learned. You got out of it? Well, I just learned significantly more than I knew about the history of the restoration movement and different things that happened. Uh, for example, like. Just, I'm a sorry. I was a little caught off guard with that. First yeah, question. I enjoyed I just, doing that. People. I just learned a lot more about the restoration movement uh, historically than I had known before going into the course. Let me give you a softer question. Okay. <laughs> Imagine that you're just at lunch with somebody who's not familiar with the Churches of Christ. Uh huh. You're not going to go into a major. Um, theological discussion, but they say, what is the restoration movement? What would you say? Mm, the process that uh, uh, in America, can, wow, let me think about how to answer this before I just say something. The you can process, imagine the situation, can't you? They, they heard somebody say restoration movement. They're yeah. not one of us. Maybe they go to school here and they say, what is that? Uh, I would say the process that the American colonies went through to get to more of a theological walk with Christ in their religion. Okay. That may or that may not be the most sufficient answer, but that's probably about what I would say. I do think that it has something to do with uh, it is an American movement, and it does have to do with independent American thinking and laying aside the established church. I can I can see that, but um, do you think that it would be best if you had to teach that course? We'd be pretty desperate, but if, if we had to have you teach that course. I agree. We would, be would you emphasize more the doctrines that came out of the Restoration Movement or the historical facts of the Restoration Movement? I think there would need to be a healthy balance. Uh, I mean, I don't think that you can justifiably teach a course like that talking about the the historical facts that came out of the restoration movement without also talking about the theological beliefs that the individuals had okay let me jump over and pick on garen and it was a similar question yes sir <clears throat> start with that uh question imaginary scenario somebody sitting there at your table at lunch we're not going to go into great detail what is the restoration movement? I would say it was 200 years ago. And this is how I would say, I mean, given a time frame, 200 and, and some odd years ago, um, where a couple of guys were studying up Barton and Barton Stone and, and Alexander Campbell, um, were really just trying to figure it out. Um, they didn't like the way their church settings were going. Uh, they didn't feel like it matched exactly what scripture had. And so their goal was to kind of switch some things around. And that ended up a whole bunch of different ways. Um, but it is what has trickled down into the Church of Christ. That's what the Church of Christ can trace back to um, is, is, is what I would say. And I would say their stone and, and Campbell's goal was to get back to the to the first century church. Are we, still, are we still the restoration movement or part of it? Um, I guess, I mean, if you were going to look at it a thousand years later, you might include this time period, maybe, I don't know. In the restoration movement, the, I mean, the class we took, I mean, we went all the way up to the independent churches of Christ. Um, almost, uh, unless you sorry. count the uh, non-institutional, that was maybe more recent break. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was, I mean, that was all the way up to the, I guess, nineties or so, or, or maybe even mm -hmm. into the thousands. Um, and so, I mean, that came all the way up to here. And so then I could, I mean, I would say that there's definitely still some, some changes going on in the church of Christ for sure. Especially when you have the rise of the, I mean, non-denominational institutions. And, and so I feel like that could definitely be a, a part of the restoration movement. Okay. And the final question. Can I make a comment? Uh, yeah, go right ahead. It, it's, it's, it's interesting because it, it, your question was, are we still in the restoration uh, period or, or movement? Are we still almost, in the restoration movement? It, it, it almost seems that we have not reached the 
as far as we can go. But in some sense, it's almost like it's 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 now it's turning, it's going in a different direction. Mm. That is not I'm, more so about you know restoring uh, to the apostolic uh, um, pattern, but it's almost like now it's 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 going into a different direction where churches of Christ, some churches of Christ, and, and, and I would say leaders, preachers, and, and and men are going into a direction of being more liberal, mm -hmm. you know, versus trying to restore. We're trying to get away from the restore, this rest restoring and apostolic and trying to almost include a liberal view and a worldly view into into uh, into Christianity now. Yeah, I think that's a good, a good thought. OK, let's jump to the last major category. And that is ministry skills. Let's go to Tucker. Um, what's, your, what's your degree plan? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you there. What's your degree plan track? Uh, ministry. It got it was pulpit ministry, but they just changed it to ministry. I think. Okay. So how how much have you learned about ministry separate from uh, from scripture? about ministry skills? I think I've learned uh, quite a bit. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think that it was is very beneficial that we have the courses, you know, specified for ministry. Um, and I think George has already kind of talked about the preacher and his work class. Although that's not a um, required course for text majors or um, youth, youth and family ministry majors, I think it should be. Because uh, that course is the most beneficial for learning all sides of ministry. I mean, we even talked about, um, you know, taxes as a preacher, as a minister. Uh, I know that's not really a minister skill, but, I mean, it did cover some a wide range of, of topics. Um, I'm trying to think about other, thing, other classes, I guess, local church leadership and um, practical evangelism and ministry. Um, those classes were just incredible and again those are don myers courses and and don dr myers does just such an incredible job um with those courses and, and i mean he just the way he teaches them the way he you know handles them he's just he's incredible and uh i learned so much about ministry uh about the skills in ministry what we have to do really that ministry is not just a you know our vocation it's our lives i mean it's, it's who we are um, and it goes on at all times that practical evangelism and ministry course really taught us that. And, um, you know, we've got to be able to, um, not only preach, you know, in the pulpit and pre teach in the classes, but, you know, really apply that to our daily lives and, and, uh, you know, live it out when we're outside of the, uh, you know, the gathering of the church. Um, those courses were great. And I learned so much in those courses. George, I think that you have a little bit different perspective because you are already quite active in ministry as you took your courses. Were there some things in ministry skills courses that you thought, yeah, that's right, and I'm glad they're telling them that, but you already knew it? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, let's see, what part of it? Um, uh like in work of the preacher or something yeah i i, I would say more so um the um preaching let me see what what course was that um the, the uh, sermon I mean, yeah yeah sermon preparation i think mm -hmm. it was called bible was the bible lesson and sermon preparation. Yeah, now it's called bible lessons because we have women in there mm -hmm. and and that was um Ooh. you know I, I i had already been uh the last four years been training under our senior minister uh, but not in depth like this. And so, but because I was preparing for lessons each week and sermons probably twice a month, uh, it really helped me uh, zoom out and and and, and really um, take inventory of how I approach uh, each particular lesson and sermon, not just putting stuff, you know, not, not just getting something together so I can deliver it, but it was more so, it, it was it very intentional. My approach uh, I was the portal. I was like a portal to connect God's word 
with the um, with the audience, with the church. And so uh, my approach to to scripture and my approach to Bible lessons has been a lot more strategic and, and intentional now than it was mm-hmm. before. Um, and I, I don't know how often uh, my, my brothers here uh, teach or, or preach. Um, and, and I, I hope more you're going to do more uh, and, and you'll start seeing how preparation is key. And it's and I, I get sometimes frustrated because uh, like even today I have to preach on Sunday and I'm struggling a little bit with, OK, do I preach on, on a little bit of the history of Easter? Uh, or, or should I just avoid it all together, you know? Um, but then I, I'm, my kids are out of school and I can't spend time with them or my wife because I, I got to go to class and prepare. So, but that's just the nature of our, of our, of our work. So I'm glad you brought up the, how to present lessons because that was where I was going next. Let's jump over to Jonah again. Hello. Yeah. Preparing lessons is not a big part of your curriculum, is it? Didn't you just have to take one of those? Uh, uh, preparation, delivery of... I've taken... Mm. Out I, of can't, I couldn't hear you. You're talking about classes I've taken on preparing curriculum? Yeah, at, at not, not curriculum. At Faulkner, everybody has to take what used to be called preparation, delivery of sermons. Now it's called yeah, preparation, which, delivery of Bible lessons. Did you yeah. have to take advanced preaching or expository preaching or anything like that? No, I only took that one, that first one. Okay. Um, They're doing expository preaching, I think, this semester, though. Okay. Or maybe last semester, I don't remember. Do you wish you had more how-to-do lessons classes, or are you good with what you got? Uh, I feel like I'm pretty good with what I've got, to be honest. I didn't. I don't feel like I really got a whole lot out of the prep and delivery class. That was my question. Y'all are. Just, I mean, your minds are just right in in where mine is. Now, you had mentioned before that there is a lot to learn about how to do youth ministry, and yes. that you get a lot of it in a course called youth ministry. Mm-hmm. But you uh, you wish you had that spread out, and 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 you feel like there's more to learn. Is, yes. is that a fair statement? Yes. Can you give me some examples, just one or two things off the top of your head? What insight or information did you get from some youth ministry class that, that helped you so you'll be a better youth minister? How to better be prepared for interviews with elders and parents. How to uh, keep trust with your youth uh, and where to draw the line and say, OK, this is something that I have to report to my elders and or parents. Uh, and how to properly uh, get your parents engaged in youth events are three things off the top of my head. Of course, we call it youth and family, and uh, mm-hmm. Dr. Wedge's degree is in family studies. Uh, do you think that, you know, the studies like parent and child or whether you took that or not or uh, different age stages, are those family type studies important to what you're going to do? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so you, we need to keep those in there. Yes, I think they, they need to be. They need to be added to as well. Okay. Let oh, me. Uh, the, but others. Okay. All right. Uh, Gary. Yes, sir. Uh, how many preaching courses did you take? Prep and delivery. Did you take any others? No, sir. Okay. Uh, well, how I didn't take Trina's work. But I mean, we did oh, several about, about the deliver, preparation delivery of lessons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How much did you learn in the one class you did take? Um, quite a good amount. It was with Dr. Myers. Um, and we did. I mean, lessons every every week almost. Um, and that was something. One of the main things that, and I might mentioned this before in class, main things that I wanted to improve on. Um. Uh, coming to Faulkner was speaking. I didn't do Elijah Leaders or, or anything like that growing up. And so I hadn't really spoke too much in front of uh, people or anything. So um, those classes are really beneficial to me because I didn't have very much to go off of. So, I mean, going from coming to Faulkner, not ever have spoken. I spoke, I did my first sermon 
um, the second semester I was at Faulkner at university just on a Wednesday night. That was the first one I've ever done. Um, and I thought it, it went pretty well. And, um, and then, then the next year I was preaching twice a Sunday, uh, at, for Lafayette for that, the whole last year and a half. So, um, it's been quite an improvement for me. And so I, I really enjoyed those classes or that class. Oh, good. Uh, did you take anything else that you would call a ministry skills class? Yours is um, text. Yes, sir. Uh, this may not be exactly it, but I think it should be. Uh, Christian evidences, I, I feel mm -hmm. like, is a is is a class that every student at Faulkner should take, especially if it's taught by Dr. Sokolowski, because it is so so beneficial. Um, and then the class that we took, uh, practical evangelism and missions. I mean, that's a a ministry course, mm -hmm. and uh, combining the class, the Christian evidences into mm -hmm. that class um, mm -hmm. was really, 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 really good. Um, so having taken those back to back was very beneficial for me. Christian evidence is, is just, I mean, it was a, a great course that really pushed me um, to, to read a lot more than I'm used to, um, mm -hmm. to think deeply, um, and really to come up with these, I mean, it's it basically arguments. Um, I mean, to where this is what somebody's going to say to you, and then you have these, these, these answers. Um, and, and, and this is something that you can study yourself and, and, and understand. So, yeah, I feel like that class is really, really good. All right, folks, I know I've kept you over. It's very valuable what you're doing for you to articulate it for yourself and for, for the program. So on these uh, remaining optional ones, I want to hear from somebody, but not from everybody. Uh, anybody have feelings about the emphasis on scholarly research? Feelings first. How do you feel about how much emphasis we have on that? Um, I didn't. I mean, I didn't really comment on it just because I didn't really feel like it was too, like I guess not. I like guess not important, but it, it wasn't like a major emphasis. Um, I didn't feel like, and I don't feel like it necessarily should be for for most students. Um, but it it was talked about and obviously we've done, we're doing an exegesis right now. Um, I've done, we did a critical issues paper. Uh, I mean, those types of things were handled in a way to be done scholarly. They weren't like just a, hey, write, write this down and, and turn it in how, however you want to. It was, I mean, SBL, mm -hmm. do those types of things. Um, and, and so I feel like those things were taught in, in those papers and, and, and those types of assignments. Well, uh, uh, the fact that we have you know, orientation to biblical studies basically is all about how to write a paper, um, write a biblical paper. And so we harped on scholarly research like for weeks in that course. So I think that's enough of it. That's enough. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did any of you expect that you will be writing scholarly papers? after you're done going to school i mean i would love to to an extent not like as a job but like yeah i'd like to publish a book one day yeah a book or i don't know some type of or contribute to a, a journal or something i don't know I, i'd like to do that i just don't know um what the future holds we'll see <laughs> how evenly balanced are your different teachers on how many of them require really high standard scholarly work and how many of them the assignments aren't so strictly scholarly? Does it vary a lot from teacher to teacher? It doesn't vary a lot, I don't think. Yeah, it doesn't vary a lot, but it, there definitely are some who require like, nitpicky. yeah, like very nitpicky about yeah. everything, which is, you know, yeah. that's part of it. But And there are some teachers who are like kind of relaxed and don't really care. Um, about it but for the most part it's pretty consistent yeah i mean i think it's different sometimes you'll be docked for something and another teacher will just point it out for you say hey you could do this a little better and, and not dock you i guess and then that'd be the differences you sound yeah. comfortable with it's okay if it's different from class to class yeah yeah <laughs> okay. let's jump to biblical studies some of you love it who really likes uh, i said biblical studies i meant biblical languages oh 
I love them. Yeah, I really uh, enjoy them. I, I again, I I think I think Greek should be required for everybody personally, um, because that's the original language the New Testament was written in, and um, it's uh, again I, I was so intimidated to take that course, and I was scared of the workload. And let me tell you, that was it was one of the heaviest workloads by far. You know, homework every single night and horrible sometimes quizzes and long exams, but it was worth it. And that's what it vocab words. But that's what it takes for a foreign language. And that's I mean, I love that course. I love Dr. Parker. I I think he's one of the smartest and, you know, brightest professors that we have um, because he'll tell you straight. And we I mean, I consider him to be a friend now, too. and that course you don't is think awesome. we should get a harder Greek teacher that he's not hard enough? If you get a harder one, we people may not survive. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, and well, you wonder I, why it's not hard anymore. Hey, 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 hey with, with Greek one and two, I um, I thought my wife was going to divorce me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I, have, wow. I have time to even kiss her, man. I, I was so stressed out. It stretched me more than any other course. I cannot believe that I got through it. And I actually made an A in it. I, yeah. I'm very, I was like, how, I said, I think that, I think it was a uh, professor G. Is it G? Mm-hmm. He, t- he teaches this. And uh, he, um, uh, he, he was, he was very gracious to me too, because, uh, you know, uh, if, if I didn't get something right, he, he allowed me time to, to, uh, to fix it. But, but yeah, um, I, I would say it's bittersweet. You know, you're talking about feelings, uh, Greek, as well as the, the, uh, the papers, man, it's just bitter. It's bittersweet because uh, I hate doing it because I'm I'm not a very technical person. I'm not, mm-hmm. and so it really challenges me. But at the end of it, I realize I have a skill. I'm more developed, and so that that's yeah. the sweet part about it. Greek yeah. is awesome. So yeah. valuable. And Hebrew is good too. <laughs> I'm getting it. it. Probably is. No, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh. I, we've taken so much time. Right now, the catalog says that all Bible majors are expected or are required, I don't remember the word, to participate in our study abroad. Of course, we make exceptions for people who have jobs and things like that. Um, Should we keep saying that it's required? I mean, I don't think it is. It's not required because people are not going. um, And I know people who are not planning to go that are at school right now. Yeah, and I can just go ahead and say I also had initially not planned on coming on study abroad, and it was not an issue at all. I mean, I, I am on study abroad because my circumstances changed, but it wasn't going to be – I wasn't going to face any consequences for not being able to go. Okay. Uh, well, along that line, though, I do want to hear from you. Ken? Um, if I have an advisee who's torn about whether to go or not, and yeah. – Often the uh, the question is, do I just can't go into any more debt? Um, do you think even when you're paying off your debt, you'll be glad you went? Absolutely. Yes, sir. No doubt about it. One hundred percent. I agree. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Tell me off the top of your head why you're glad you went over there. I want to hear from each of the three of you. It is. I mean, one of the most beneficial things that, that Faulkner uh, allow, has allowed me to do, um, seeing these things, having these memories, um, being able to picture the Sea of Galilee, I mean, and, and picture where Jesus walked in Capernaum, um, I mean, and all these other places uh, is, is insane. Stepping on Mars Hill where, where Paul spoke um, is, was, I mean, it was crazy, I guess. And, and to have it with, Dr. Edwards also makes a, a, a in, incredible plus um, because he's just so, so knowledgeable. Um, and he loves that stuff. He loves oh, my it. God. Loves it. His I mean, passion. passion. He's incredible. I mean, this is why he's on this earth, to, I, I think. <laughs> Seriously. Um, he's he shared it with thousands and thousands so of students good. over the years. Yeah. I mean, okay, he, go quickly, and, and then, uh, Jonah, why are you glad you went? I, uh, I, I'm glad I came for the same reasons because, like, I'll – I'll never read the Bible the same because now that we've seen these places, we'll picture them every time that we read the Bible and we'll know exactly what the biblical writers are talking about. And, 
you also grow so close to the people you're with, the faculty you're with, and the people you meet while you're over here, the tour guides, people who take care of the hotel. It's one of the greatest trips, and I think it should be required, although um, I know some people can't make it, but everybody should do this trip. Maybe highly encouraged. Yeah, for sure. I'll just go ahead and say I agree with everything these two guys said. Uh, for me, for my personal reasons for coming on study abroad, I'll just say be upfront about, um, you know, after being at Faulkner for an extra year um, and at, in that process getting very frustrated because, you know, I've been ready to graduate and be done with school and to get off of campus. There were a lot of frustrations that I had built up over just drama and stuff like that, that you begin to see as you mature and grow up um, that I see like in the student body and, and on campus, just typical stuff where people consider things more important than they actually are. Um, and so one of the reasons I wanted to come on study abroad and I was so excited that I was going to be able to after things worked out was because I told myself, you know, no matter what I do, I want this this last semester while I'm traveling to be a semester where I, I rebuild my relationship with God and where I come out feeling closer to God than I ever have. And to be able to do things like go and take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee, to take the Lord's Supper in Jerusalem, to walk through the Garden of Gethsemane and all these other places, I truly do feel closer to God than I ever have in my life. Um, and it's because now, like Garen said, I can look back uh, when I'm reading different passages in the Bible and picture these places in my head from my own perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's an experience that you can't get through a PowerPoint slide or, or through a, a course on campus. And it's worth all the money. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, and to honestly, I mean, I know a lot of people stress about going a little bit more in depth, but – for all the stuff that we've gotten to do, you know, that price that we're paying is it's it's little to nothing. I mean, right. truly. Right. So. I'm glad it's been such a good experience for you. Two things, um, well, uh, two and a half things I still want us to talk about. Ooh, uh, one is, um, has anybody had bad experience because a course was online? Oh. <laughs> Let's yeah. We were just we were just what, talking. What are the challenges we have with taking courses online? Number one, Blackboard is garbage. Amen. Let's just go. I, I hate to say it, but Blackboard, Blackboord is one of the one worst. Of the worst. It's from the depth. It, it's it's terrible. It's um, <laughs> number two, a lot of the video. I mean, I don't know if you go to an orientation like the professors on Blackboard or not, but a lot of our classes like fail to either record or they fail to record audio. They fail to pick up parts of the class. It skips through whatever it is. And um, it's sometimes kind of hard to learn. And especially if you're on study abroad and you have five courses that are back home, it's almost impossible to keep up with all the work. Like it, it, there's gotta be some type of system for study abroad students because it's just, it's beyond difficult keeping up with all the work online. Yeah, the regular online system that they implement for people back in the States does not work here. For example, I got – there's an online – an eight-week course I'm taking, uh, American Cultural Heritage, just a, a small uh, history course that I needed to wrap up one, one other degree requirement. Um, I, in the second and third week of the course, we were in Israel – uh, when we left, I was we it was with the intention of okay we'll have Wi-Fi um, in Israel and we did but it was very very bad and I couldn't get Lord. Blackboard to open on my computer at any of our hotels or anywhere where I went with Wi-Fi and then I got back the day that the assignments for the following week were due so that was two weeks in a row I wasn't able to post I emailed my professor and told her and I had told her and the other professor over the course in January, I would be on study abroad, but I got withdrawn from the class, had to go through an, a ridiculous um, experience appealing that to get back in the course because it wasn't my fault that I couldn't post. But um, because she was trying to follow her typical online, um, uh, she was, what do you call it? Um, I didn't have anybody really on my side until I called Todd Brenneman and, and explained to him what happened. Um, so, so I would 
uh, definitely say that. But or back Tucker up with the, we need something different for online for students on study abroad. Now we'll maybe get with Dr. Edwards on that. Um, I want any other problems you faced. Plus, if anybody has anything positive to say about it, and I also want to know, would you recommend taking the eight-week Greek courses online? <laughs> No. I don't know anything about the eight-week Greek courses. I didn't even know there were. But I have taken probably, besides George, I've probably taken the most online because I worked a 20, 25-hour a week part-time job um, for two years, I mean, my, my freshman and sophomore year, and then up to this, so two and a half years, the three years I've been at Faulkner. Um, and so I, I usually had to adjust my schedule around to where I could have some free mornings and so I, I would usually take two to three um, online a semester while still, I mean, coming on class usually like one day a week or two days a week. And so um, this was, for me, extremely beneficial because I was able to make money. Um, I was able to have experience in a, a work field um, as well as balance. And I kind of talked about this in the thing I typed out. Um, but online classes for me were, were super, super beneficial. Because instead of waking up at 8.30, which I know is not like super early, but instead of waking up early and, um, and getting to class and, and having to understand what exactly is, is being said um, right then and there, um, I can take time whenever I'm fully awake, fully prepared, fully um, attentive, and, and can look at the class. And if I miss something, somebody comes up and talks to me or something that I'll look, I can just rewind it and go back and learn. So for me personally, it was really beneficial to take online classes while at Faulkner. And I had, every time I had to get it approved because apparently you're only supposed to be allowed like two or three of your entire thing at Faulkner, which I know that's not something that's usually stuck to, but still I, I had to go through the process of getting them approved each time, which wasn't a big deal. But basically what I'm trying to say is online classes were super beneficial to me being able to, go through Faulkner um, and still be able to, to work and, and do those other things on the side. Um, and I think it's more beneficial for me to be online. I feel like I've learned more online than I have in the classroom. And that's not to fault of anybody I've had in the classroom. It's just the way I guess I'm. It suits you better. Yeah, it just suits me yeah. better. I, I would say a positive thing real quick. I think Garen's right. Online classes, while sometimes we do have malfunctions and stuff, and it's hard over here at Study Abroad, they need, they, like, we need them. I think it allows people to be flexible without actually having to be on, uh, on ground. And I've still learned a ton through online courses. Even though I prefer being in class, I learn better that way. I've still learned a ton on the online courses. Okay. We have run a real long time, and I'll take any more comments after we do this next one. But um, the one thing I want to ask you about, then the half one is, is what you want to say about your professors. Um, many people believe, and, and I ran into this with uh, the accreditation of the graduate program, that it's very important that the Bible majors have a lot of interaction with one another, that they build relationships with one another. Uh, two part question. Do you see that need? And has it been done well in your experience? I absolutely see the need for it, but I do not think that we've done a great job of it. Um, this Bible club was supposed to start this year, I think. And Are you all went to Europe? Well, I'm, I'm talking about last semester it was supposed to start, and it nothing really came about. I will say we did start those um, faculty and Bible dinner. meetings, dinner, dinners or whatever, but you know, those are once a month. And, and boy, did we get some t-shirts. Oh yeah. <laughs> what? We did get a t-shirt. Oh, oh, t-shirt. oh yeah. We did get a t-shirt for the Bible club, but I think that like, Man, we never had I don't know. <laughs> I, I think that it was very important that the Bible majors are close and that they have, you know, a good rapport with each other. Uh, and it, with it, the faculty. And with the faculty. It's, it's, it's really important because the stronger we are together, the stronger we can be you know, as a, as a collective group and uh, to influence the campus and beyond that. Anybody want to well, Let me jump over to George. Yours has been all online, but do you feel like you know people? Feel like you know these guys over in Europe? 
Uh, I've, I've had more interaction with with them than any any other students in my courses. Um, so you know, because I'm able to see their faces and 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 talk to them. Uh, I, I wish it was, um, you know, a way that. Um, and, and I know it's it's tough being online, but if there was some way we could have a virtual um, class where whoever's online, we're able to I'm able to see the screens, and we're able to converse while the teacher is teaching. Uh, because a lot of times what happens is if they're online, you never know they're they're in class. They never say anything. So um, you know, and maybe that's just on the instructor to to yeah. try to encourage um, the students to to be visible. You know, those kind of things help us. Uh, we, we need to consider that for the future. Uh, finally, and um, be before we go to finally, uh, was there anything else anybody was just dying to say besides about the faculty? <laughs> I made you sit a long time. You 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 are a a a, a very good man. I love your spirit. Um, Dr. Ellis, you, um, you're very patient. Um, I think great sense of humor. You, you, you kind spirited and you've been very good. And, um, to, to me during this semester, um, and, and I really appreciate you. I appreciate your heart and uh, understanding what I'm going through, uh, and being very encouraging and praying for me, man. So I really appreciate that though. Echo that. Now, Finally, this is a message for your faculty. We frequently hear from our students that they are almost surprised at how real their relationships are with their professors, that they really know them and they really feel free to talk to them. Uh, I'm sure there have been exceptions to that. Uh, how do you rate overall your relationship with Bible faculty members. Let's just start with Jonah and go to Garen, to Tucker, and we'll end up with uh, with George. All right, do me a favor, repeat the question one more time, please. How do you rate your relationship with your professors in the sense that you actually feel like you know them and you could go to them for academic or personal reasons? When Okay, so my professors overall or like individually? Overall. Okay, I would say like as far as that goes, maybe like a three. There's only a few professors I feel like I know that that well. Okay, if it's just those three, how high do you rate them? Uh, oh, I wasn't saying three professors. I was saying uh, there's out of the pro professors I feel like I, I know well, then I would say much higher, like a like an eight or a nine. Um, but that's a handful, right? Yes, just a handful of professors. Okay, Gary? Um, How do you rate student relationships with, with faculty here, Bible faculty in particular, from your experience? Um, I rate them very highly. Um, I think, I mean, I mean, Dr. G, Dr. Parker, um, Dr. Bailey, uh, Dr. Sokolowski, um, Dr. Brenneman, you, uh, Dr. Myers. I mean, really, anybody I've had, because they, as you repeat so many times, um, and it's not like it, I don't mean that poorly, but I mean, if you're taking five classes and we don't have, we might have a, a big Bible faculty, um, but the main courses that were, that were being taught are, are by the same people. So, I mean, there was just, I had uh, Dr. G, I had for a year and a half in a row. Um, and so, and it was in the same room. I had Hebrew with him two semesters, and the next semester I had Isaiah with him. And and so, uh, I mean, we built up a, a great rapport that during that time, and I, I could go and talk to him about anything. Um, and same way with, with Dr. Myers, I've had him three times, and uh, Dr. Sokolowski I've, I've had two times, and Dr. Brenneman a couple times. So really, I mean, I, I think it's very, very, very good. Um, I'd rate it as, as, I mean, as high as it can be. I know just because, um, I mean, I have friends at, at other universities, I mean, they don't have relationships at all necessarily with their professors. They get in and get out um, and move on. And and so I, I, I like that that's not the case at Faulkner, um, that the fact that I can put Dr. Brenneman or Dr. Sosklowski or any of them really, 
um, down as references. Um, and, and I know that they could say more than just he was a great student. I mean, they could speak to my personality or character and, and anything along those lines. So very highly. Sorry, I was longer than you probably would need. But. Uh, I appreciate everything you said. Tucker, do you have anything to say that hadn't been said? No, I, I agree with Garen. Um, I rate the, you know, the faculty student relationships very high. I feel like I could go to any, any teacher that I've had and quite frankly, any teacher that I haven't had and they'd help me with any scheduling issue, any issue that I'm having in my life. I really do think that they would help. And I, I again, Garen said it, you repeat these teachers kind of over and over again and you grow closer and closer to them. So I, I really, really, really enjoy, um, the faculty at Faulkner. I feel blessed to have had every professor that I've had. Uh, I, I love the professors there. So. So George, you get to wrap it up for us. Uh, it is significant that your relationships with the faculty are either online or on the phone. Um, how would you rate your relationships with the Faulkner Bible faculty considering that it's all been electronic? Uh, I would say good. I, I, would say, I would say good. Matter of fact, I would say very good. I had one bad experience with one um, professor, um, just the lack of communication, and I screamed out to uh, Dr. Todd about it, and he jumped on it immediately. One thing he does really well is respond quickly. Oh, yeah. And he helped me out, and he tried to mediate through the process, but, uh, and he did, uh, you know, praise be to God, uh, I was able to walk away without a, a, a grade that would, um, you know, destroy my GPA, and, um, uh, so, but besides that one bad experience, it has been really, really good. So, if I if I had to rate it out of a ten, I would go ahead and put it at a, put it as a ten. Amen. Well, let me tell you, gentlemen, uh, I, I thoroughly enjoy getting to know you better this semester. Uh, I, I almost paid for it at the end, but I, I would like to move on. I know you would too. Uh, I. I Wish you the best. I know we'll still be in touch on some assignments and things. Uh, keep in touch with me anyway. And um, <clears throat> come back home. You can come see us sometime, of course, because you have so much spare time. Yes, sir. Thanks. And, yes, sir. Thank all right. You so much. Be sure to email me any questions or concerns you have about finishing up. And yes, you're sir. Gonna, you're going to email us about the interview? Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll email you as soon as I get offline. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. See you, Thank George. You. Thank you. George. Right. God bless you, guys.